So, hello everybody. Um, welcome um, to our masterclass today on uh, mastering sales into Europe. Um, I am going to focus the, um, the masterclass today on a startup survival kit that I've written on how to enter and survive on the European market. Um, in between, if you've got um, any questions, feel free to use the chat function. I've got an eye on this also. Um, so when anything is unclear, please write down the question in the chat and I will refer to it during my presentation. So who am I? So I am the, the guy with the mustache uh, standing in the middle right next to our um, founder, Eric. Um, my name is Dennis, Dennis Birkholzer. Um, rather German name. I <laughs> read it in the chat when you are uh, looking for me on LinkedIn or trying to find me online. Um, I have a sales background. I come from marketing, product management and sales. And I was working for more than seven years already in B2B sales coming from um, actually uh, um, a technical pre-sales at IBM that I did for the collaboration tools before they were sold to a different company. Uh, I did this even during my university time. Um, in my whole sales career, I've worked mostly for agencies or for um, B2B tech startups. Uh, some have worked out well, some have not. And I have nevertheless gained a lot of experience in the past years, especially when you're working in startups. It's like you are on the um, on the fast track when it comes to anything um, related to um, to expertise in any kind of field. And now I am working for SpinLab, the HHL accelerator. It's a um, um, early stage acceleration program located in Leipzig in um, the former eastern part of Germany. Now it's only geographically eastern and we focus on startups from industries of energy, health and smart cities. So we care about the, the startups, uh, everything related to, let's say, the city of the future. And I am there, one of the, the coaches specialized, of course, in sales, but also um, business development, project management and internationalization. So, so um, when thinking about the European market, um, I thought of okay, what is like the, the most relevant market due to the size uh, in terms of money and people. The German market is the most relevant market. And even uh, and on top of this, the German market is also, um, I think, the, the most special market, even though it's my home market. I was born in Germany. I'm a German citizen and I was raised my entire life in Germany. I did sales to other European countries, but when it came to Germany, it was um, you know, more difficult to, to get in there to sell something. And I thought, okay, why is it so hard to sell on the German market? Is Germany somehow special? And yes, there are some things uh, that I, when looking into statistics like uh, on, on statista.com or from our uh, government data, you see that Germany is a rather old economy. So we don't really have these, um, okay, but there are some, uh, some other uh, examples here, but mostly we've got some, what, what we call old economy. We mostly, don't focus on digital product that much. We mostly focus on yeah, building cars or machinery. Um, so it's not really that that digital kind of economy that we have here. On top, the people are rather old also in this kind of industry working there for, for 20 plus years. It's not that uh, volatile when it comes to changing the job and working for different companies. You um, go to a corporate and stay there for a long time. Also, the digital infrastructure is not that mature as we've seen in other European countries, um, which is also um, a big struggle that we're having right now at the moment with the whole corona situation, where we see that the digital infrastructure is really missing when it comes to working from home or doing homeschooling when school's not um, open. So we are not, let's say, up to date when it comes to um, the digital infrastructure here in Germany. Also, um, looking into um, the first point again, old economy working with rather 
people that are older than I am, we also, so what I've observed is a lot of conservative thinking, which is like the results of the M2 elements mentioned above. So we um, also, when we look into our governmental structure, um, having a ruling party that comes from a rather conservative uh, political view, all these things can seem it uh, um, to make it very difficult for, let's say, a digital product or for startups to enter this kind of old, not digitalized and conservative market. But on the other hand, it also leads to a lot of opportunities that we see here because there's room for change. There is uh, um, there, there is the infrastructure that can be digitized. There are these um, people that will at some point also leave the corporate and make place for younger people. So behind all these, let's say, negative aspects, when we want to be mean, um, let's say, behind all these challenges that we face here on the German market, there's a market full of opportunities, full of um, potential that especially um, young corporates, young startups, and uh, digital products can address to. So when we want to sum it up, it seems like Germany doesn't really have an innovation culture because innovation was, was needed um, in the past time. When um, also trying to address corporates, this is my personal observation here, there are only a few um, first movers, so people that you can really address and really go for um, a pilot project with a new um, digital product that you can address here. Also, it's always hard to actually get into these companies. It seems like, uh, due, um, not YouTube, but um, in regards to the um, regional differences we have in Germany, there seem to be some kind of closed circles that there are um, companies that work together because they know uh, they have been working together for a long time or they know each other for a long time or because they are closely together or uh, it's like it's it's we we've already uh, we we always did it like we are doing it here so there are a lot of um, interesting um, yeah, specialities on the German market when it comes to um, the whole innovation culture and the openness to new solution and new people to work with. And uh, also a very difficult uh, point that I faced a lot is the, yeah, the still very, also a reference to the slide before, to the conservative thinking, is the hierarchy and the um, the feeling of missing responsibilities, especially when it comes to new products. It's hard to get decisions because of the, the hierarchy and the missing responsibilities, especially when you're coming with a new solution into a company that yeah, it doesn't really fit the, the corporate's processes. When there's no process where this product can be matched to, and of course, when there's no process for this in a German company, there is no responsibility. So there are a lot of um, things and a lot of obstacles that I've observed making it somehow difficult to enter the, the uh, European's biggest market. And also what we are very special for, um, it's the bureaucracy and the missing of agile project management. When it comes to um, project management in a German corporate, Germans like to see the beginning of a project and when to know when the project is done. When you um, talk about iterative product development and MVPs, that's hard to um, make clear to um, a German customer that this can also be a benefit when we start with a not wholly finished, furbished product, but also with a small MVP that we then try to um, iterate on and improve during the application um, of this product in a corporate. It's um, a very, um, very, very interesting thing. And coming back to the bureaucracy, it's also a reference to the hierarchy and the missing responsibilities due to the very process-focused um, way German corporates operate. Also, when you deal with public institutions, bureaucracy is everywhere. 
as we can see today with the whole corona situation and the vaccination in Germany, bureaucracy is one of the biggest um, challenges that we face also in our public lives. Every foreigner that comes to Germany will um, experience this firsthand how bureaucracy is done in our economy. So this is the, the way I observed addressing German corporates. On the other hand, of course, is the, um, the thing how um, is it only them? So, um, of course, it's not only the, the corporates would make it difficult to sell to, um, but um, as I am coaching a lot of startups, I've made also observation from the other side. So how um, yeah, it's also difficult for startups to address their counterparts and interested um, people on the German market. So, and I wanted to give a small action plan on how and what startups or you, if you're interested in entering the German market, can um, improve on to sell to German companies. Of course, you should stop being scared of selling. Um, that's a very interesting thing that I've observed a lot. Um, I have addressed that some German companies or European companies expect a product to be 100% ready, fit to market, furbished, polished, whatsoever, the perfect product, as it's, it's uh, you yeah, know, in in, in the, the, the small portion of cases, it's actually the case that it's like that. Um, so stop being scared of selling. So try to, if you are um, scared of hard sell, talk about your product, get feedback um, about the product. There's a um, good paper called The Four Steps to Epiphany by Steve Blank um, from um, Stanford, I think, Stanford University, um, who said that he also observed a lot of companies trying to get their product to the market and he observed that there are four um, steps. The first step is um, the step of customer discovery. So it's about having an assumption of the value your product wants to provide. And then you don't do the hard sell, but you go out to potential customers to talk about the product, to get feedback, and then not iterate your product development process, but uh, iterate on the way you uh, propose your value that you have about your product and see if the way you communicate the value that you think your product has and see if there's a match with potential customers. If not, you have to rethink if you've got the right product market fit. So is the value that you present um, actually a uh, real proven value for your target audience or if you need to change your communication, need to think about additional values or need um, another target audience. Then of course you have to reflect all these findings, all the uh, verification, falsification of your product feedback from the customer side with your product development team and see how uh, you can then iterate the, the communication strategy and see if there's a match also with the, um, the product development which you have. At the end, you should not change your product. You can change the roadmap a bit. Changing the product is way harder than changing only the communication about the product. So, and even having this more like consultative approach is talking about the product, getting feedback of your product, which then makes the product development easier and gets you closer, closer, closer to the and product market fit is making it much easier to sell and uh, gaining with this experience and with an improved product roadmap, it's much easier to actually go to, go to the market and sell your product. I don't know if you will ever get like 100% product market fit, but uh, talking about solu uh, your solution, not doing it the hard sell, but really um, asking a lot of questions, see what the pain is, um, is making it much more easier for you to sell the product and have also a very improved and mature product to um, go on the product market. Um, speaking about um, the USP, of course, all of your employees should know what the actual value of your product is, what the uh, unique selling proposition is. So how you market and how you communicate the um, assets, the features that your product has, because only um, the value, so the benefit of the application of the product for your end customer um, is 
um, the, the real USP and that's what's relevant to, to the end customer. So, and this is what all people in your company must know and uh, have to be, um, uh, have to be told about from the sales team, of course, over marketing, even down to the people in the background, all the developers, they need to know how um, and what they're actually working for. Of course, track your failures as well. Document when you failed at some point, when you've lost a customer or uh, when you get like negative feedback on your solution because only with your um, tracked failures, so with the documented data, you can approve upon. So I see um, some questions coming up in the chat. Um, that's a good point here because uh, how do I close my first customer? <laughs> Um, so you were asking me how do we bridge travel limitations and do cold mates work or local partner is mandatory? That's a good point. I, I will address this in a moment. So how to close your first customer? I think um, as I am also active on the um, on the B two match platform from uh, Europe days, I got a lot of inquiries for one on one meetings, and I see in that most of you actually do these three things. <laughs> you contacted me, and you got off your comfort zone, which you might not even have because you want to to get the feedback, get into connection with other people, and you've shown your uh, passion for your product. Showing the passion for the product is about really to be authentic about the things that you uh, you care about and that you want to show to the people and get feedback upon. Um, travel limitations at the moment are not really that relevant. Um, I did rarely leave my office, to be honest, even though I was working for a German company specialized on the German, Swiss and Austrian market, I barely did any travel. So we managed to do all the things online with a tool of our customer's choice. Um, when finding the right um, video solution, it's always a bit difficult for German companies because there are a lot of technical restrictions and compliance guidelines. Most big corporations in Germany um, cannot use Google Chrome, for example. Google Chrome is working on a protocol which um, allows it to share the video and audio, which is restricted by a lot of German corporations. So when dealing with a German corporation, you have to find the compliant tool for them, which might be some of the Cisco products, but which also might be some of the Microsoft products which are compliant to um, German IT compliance rules. So when thinking about um, doing sales from another country to the German market. You, in most cases, um, you can look up which is most compliant for the German market, which doesn't rely on any HTTPS protocols, but more like on appropriate, uh, proprietary protocols like Cisco or Microsoft products with their own dedicated um, applications. So using, like we do here, hop in is not possible because it used the RTC protocol, which is prohibited by most German corporates, but ask them when you do a phone call or by email, which solution might be working best for them. If you can invite them to a go to webinar, go to meeting or MS Teams call. Um, so, these three things, nobody cares about your product, nobody cares about your return on investment, and nobody cares about details, seem to be very harsh. But when um, reaching out to the customer, um, you have to make it very simple for the customer to understand what you're actually offering. So when addressing a customer, um, I said before, ask a lot of questions. So don't talk too much about your product. <laughs> don't go too much into details, but really focus on the actual benefit that your product provides to the end customer on your target market. Um, Germans love, we just love facts and figures. And at some point we want to know if there is a return on invest on the invest we do when uh, buying another solution. But in the first call, this is not relevant because uh, um, they think that every 
business is very, very special. So what we care more about is not the return on invest, but other testimonials. And even uh, if there are some analyst reports that you can refer to, which shows that um, the solution you offer in a certain vertical is the go-to solution for the next years or something. So that we don't buy like an outdated solution for, uh, for, for the next five years to go, but we want to see that it's somehow future-proof. Um, that we can apply the solution also in the future. And um, when thinking about um, having a future-proof solution, you have to um, show that you are the expert in the field and, and that there is no actually competition. Of course, there is competition, but call it market companions. So um, because when thinking about um, the, the, the West uh, landscape of different software products, there will be some big and cooperation that you will compete on. For example, in software business, there will always be some kind of SAP application that can also work for the um, business case you are addressing. So um, really um, state that you know the other big corporations that you are uh, competing with, but really address what the value of your application is. Are you faster? Are you cheaper? Are you easier to implement? Do they make lesser changes to the existing infrastructure? And uh, and how how fast can they be onboarded to your solution? And how can you help them being onboarded to the solution? Do you offer some kind of um, academy, some um, um, some teaching documentation, e-learning material, whatsoever, to really make it easy for um, the corporate to use your solution? So what can you do? Of course, um, you need to track everything. You need to define a sales process. So how are you going to address them? What happens if they are interested in the solution? Who is taking care of them? Do you need technical expertise besides the sales expertise? And uh, really define objective and KPIs to constantly track and observe your um, internal sales um, uh, sales progress also and please talk about the failures and mistakes that you've made along the way um, to then improve the whole sales process. There are some criteria that help you to identify the customer in the first discovery call. For example, the BANT, the band criteria, which stand for budget. Does the person have the money? Um, for A, for authority. So is the person I'm addressing the right person to talk to? N stands for need. So is there an actual pain? Um, that I can address with my solution within the company and time is, okay, when can we start the project? So is it now, is it in three months, is it whensoever? And how much time does the person have to, to work on this? And um, which also leads to the, the budget we need for um, the, the project to happen. So, so I've got... Um, Three other tips, so please don't fall for sales gurus. There are a lot of uh, people, especially when entering the German market, trying to sell you the best course on how to um, sell or make seven figures recurring revenues. These courses regularly don't work because the, the market is special. And that's also reference to the question asked by uh, Oli Ducold. May it's work, a local partner is mandatory. So local partners are not mandatory. Also when it comes to sales partners, German corporates can pay invoices coming for every um, company that's going to them, but uh, as long as the VAT is applicable. So this is, needs to be done by the, um, this has to be stated correctly in the email. So in some businesses, local partners might help when the, you need to do a lot of, uh, technical implementation, but all can be done at the customer side and not remotely because of the infrastructure, which is on-premise and not in the cloud. So you really have to see um, what's really necessary. Local partners uh, can be used when you are operating in a local market, which is very closed, like the closed circles that I've met before. Um, but it's just something that you really have to, to find out. There's no strict rule that says, okay, I need a local partner when selling to a company from Hamburg or from Munich. This is, be, is very um, individual, but coming to um, law regulatories, local German partners not um, necessary to sell on the, on the German market. 
How do you deal with the GDPR requirement for an EU present for notification without a local partner office? Um, the GDPR requirements, um, it, Eric, do you mean when it comes to the um, to storing data? When it just comes to, to selling services and without um, using like personalized data um, for notifications. I'm not an expert on this, so um, I can't really give you a clear answer here. Okay. Um, concerning marketing, uh, of course, it's always good to have a product that um, sells itself. Um, this sounds like a very stupid thing to put on a slide um, <laughs> because it's actually no brainer. Um, what I mean with this is that um, you Germans like when they find out information about their own. So when they go into Google, try to find information about um, a certain company or a certain a software that they want to apply for their uh, company and they see how you position yourself as an expert in the field. So when we, I don't know, are looking for a software integration tool to build up a data lake and you have written a white paper or a news article on this way, position some strategies on how to do, I don't know, integration projects to build up a data lake and it refers to your company, that's great. So this makes the, the product sell itself. And when you then also have got like contact form or some call to action to get in contact with you, that's even better. So that's uh, how you can you position yourself as an expert with your topic of authority, most likely the value of your product. And um, this is also make it easier to sell on the German market. And when it comes to uh, the HR department, value is bigger than money. Um, of course, value is uh, some, some kind of money that you have there. But when you're trying to hire someone for your sales department, for example, um, the person you are, you are trying to hire doesn't have to be the, the best paid person. Um, I have, so from my perspective, when you're an early stage company, it also works when you've got a lot of enthusiastic people working for your company. When you see, okay, they see the value that I can provide with my solution to my target audience and see this as, as their motivation, as their intrinsic motivation to offer a good benefit, to make the, the world easier, simpler, or better whatsoever. And where like a six figure income is not that relevant as the, the value we've presented. Um, this, might sound also a little bit strange at the moment, but when you look into the demographics of the people entering the market and see how, for example, the Generation Z is positioning themselves in terms of values and how they want to work on, on the market, um, this becomes clearer. Um, as uh, money is not uh, the key motivation, as more is the, the value of their own work is more motivating to them. Um, if you need help on entering the German market, I highly recommend to network, find local partners, not as a business partner, but as um, as some kind of network and person you can um, um, address and ask about specifics on the local market. And of course, accelerators um, help a lot. So I would really recommend to you to look at also what SpinLab does, how we can help you. We've got excellent learning material, um, e-learning material on everything startup related when it comes to sales, marketing, intellectual property, and GDPR, which I'm not an expert on, but <laughs> where we've got a lot of um, mentors in our networks with, uh, which can help you better and talk and get you through all the special EU requirements when coming from outside the European Union. So, um, so that you really have got the people you know you need to and, um, need to address. The other um, program that I highly recommend is Data Market Services. Um, it's an accelerator um, funded by the European Commission, which um, is scouting for data-driven startups at the moment. So SpinLab has got um, the focus on energy, e-health, and smart city um, startups where Data Market Services is looking for European-based data-driven startups. With European-based, of course, Israeli startups are also eligible to work in this project and uh, to apply for this accelerator. Do you recommend to take local agents? Uh, um, nah, I, I don't know if I would recommend uh, uh, agents. I really, in the first step, there are a lot of 
um, networks that help you to soft land in Germany. There are, for example, in Leipzig, the West region Leipzig, there in Berlin is Berlin Partners that really gets you in contact with um, the right partners free of charge. So um, before going with um, agent or agency um, in the market you want to address, so please look, first look for networks that you can leverage on. And um, maybe there's also like the a foreign trade agency which you can connect to. Maybe your city has got a partnership with um, another city in the foreign market that you want to enter on. So you can also um, go like the, the the public way and see if there is an agency uh, publicly funded that can help you and connect you with relevant players. So thank you very much um, for, for your questions. If you have got any questions, any further questions, um, please feel free to connect with me. I'm rather active on LinkedIn. Um, if you like, you can add me there. I see that I haven't stated my name in the whole uh, presentation. So um, I just paste my LinkedIn address into the chat so that you can um, directly get in contact with me. If you have got any other questions, I am um, happy to answer that here in the session or later um, via email or in a LinkedIn message. Thanks for your attention and yeah, it was great having you here in the master classes. Thank you very much. <laughs>